Okay. Uh, so I really would like to thank our two uh, guest speakers from today. Uh, Navarro Ferronato, uh, he's a researcher uh, from uh, the University of Insubria, uh, located in the north of Italy, in Varese. Um, he will be giving the first talk. And Mark Dalesnik, professor at Technion in Israel, so a technical university. And uh, uh, he will be giving the second talk. Uh, Navarro has been, uh, uh, well, you will lately say a few words uh, about yourself. Uh, I would like to remark that Navarro has been a student uh, in, in, this, uh, in this department, uh, also in the ESIC umbrella, which had a different name at the time you were a student here. And, uh, uh, and then uh, he had a strong experience in international cooperation, especially in the area of waste management uh, and uh, sanitary engineering. And uh, he transformed this activity and motivation also into research, into scientific research. And uh, now we really welcome Navarro for this talk. Uh, so I think uh, you, you should be able to uh, share the screen and I'll just leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zolezzi. Can you hear me well? Yes. And can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So thank you very much and nice to meet you all. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Livia and Professor Zolezzi and all the team of the ISIC. And uh, today I'm going to introduce you my experience of research and field analysis in two case studies in two countries, which are Bolivia and Madagascar. My name is Navarro Ferronato. I am an environmental engineer. I did my master's degree in the University of Trento, as Professor Zolizzi said before. And I'm PhD in environmental sciences. I'm going to introduce you my presentation titled The Development of Circular Projects in Low and Low Middle Income Countries, Examples from Bolivia and Madagascar. First of all, I would like to introduce you an experience related to a development project, which is the La Paz Recicla project that has been developed in the country, in the Bolivian country. And uh, it is an experience started with a master's degree my master's degree in environmental engineering and solid waste management and was finalized with a development project starting in 2020 and that uh, finalized at the end of 2022, so quite recently. The context of uh, La Paz, La Paz is a developing city which counts about 1 million inhabitants and it is located in the Andean areas. Bolivia is considered, is classified as a low middle income country as suggested by the World Bank. And it, it is affected by environmental issues. In regards to solid waste management, we are speaking about waste open dumping and waste open burning. And mainly we can say that 90% of the waste is disposed of in final disposal sites that can be both open dumpings or uh, sanitary landfills. In addition, waste picking, so waste pickers are active in the area. Only La Paz, they count about 1,000 waste pickers. And the high urbanization rate also affects the solid waste management planning. And that's our main issue related to a country that generates about 2.5 million tons of waste per year. And you can you have to think that almost 5% of this waste is collected informally by, by the waste pickers, why, while only a small amount is collected by a formal collection system. In this framework, we started in 2015 with, the, um, with some agreements among universities, local and Italian universities, and we started a development project. In this slide, you can see the timeline related to the steps uh, forward implementation of the development project La Paz Recicla. 
So it started in 2016 with uh, these agreements and the master degree and the first field studies conducted in cooperation with the local municipality, the local university, and of course, uh, the, the, uni the Italian university. And it was a long path uh, to obtain further agreements and cooperation with local NGOs, with local municipality, and to start drafting a development cooperation project. So both conceptualization, organization of the teamwork, as well as the action, so finding the, the financial support to the implementation of new solution took almost three to four years of work, both of field work as well as um, online work with teamwork in, in online activities. You can find more in the publication that is reported in this slide. Anyhow, at the end of the, this long path, toward the implementation of the project, we finalized a draft of um, a proposal, a project proposal that was finally financed by the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation. So this project was financed by the Italian government, we can say, and the main leader is an, NG, an Italian NGO, which is COPI, Cooperazione Internazionale, which is located in Milan and has various location in, around, I think, 23 to 25 countries. The partners are the universities. So my university, the University of Insubria, and the major university of San Andres, which, is, which was the local partner that was very important in order to elaborate the research and activities locally developed. And the beneficiary, of course, was the local municipality of La Paz. The project uh, had uh, different lines of actions. Uh, the first was related to the capacity building and training. So the organization of webinars and seminars, the organization of uh, technical courses, both for engineers and operators. And you have to imagine that the, the work started in 2020 and was finalized in three months ago. So more than the half uh, of the project was carried out during the COVID pandemic. So the, potent the potentialities of the project were uh, decreased uh, due to this, this global issue. Anyhow, we developed some online courses as this one, as ESIC uh, started uh, in 2020, we started uh, the same, some uh, online uh, events uh, within the La Paz Recycle project. And we developed also uh, research activities that was the second important line related to the project. So we developed new ideas and we conceptualized new system to uh, recycle waste, to recover waste, as well as for planning. So material flow analysis, as well as sustainability assessment, which is the last point of these project lines. Of course, innovation, technology and development were the also the focus of the project. So the implementation of new treatment systems as well as new technologies, which can be considered uh, appropriate for the local, local context. So we are speaking about pilot scale actions. So pilot scale machineries developed with local uh, know-how and local industries. And the development of course was related to the increase of the capacity of solid waste management and treatment uh, in order to resource recovery. Of course, the focus was all, always related to um, the circular economy system. Indeed, La Paz Recicla, the second title was Hacia un modelo de economia circular, which is in English, uh, towards a circular economy model. The idea is to develop these patterns within a sustainability framework. For this reason, we developed also life cycle assessment as well as material flow analysis in order to identify the environmental benefits of the project and the waste flows that can be potentially recycled. Our focus was related to two important waste streams, which are municipal solid waste on one side and on the other construction and 
demolition waste, which are considered the two waste fraction most important waste fraction generated at a global level. We are speaking about 70% of the total waste generated at global where the global level are construction demolition waste and municipal solid waste. And you can find more about the project in the uh, scientific paper that also Livia, I think, shared to you before this event. As I mentioned before, we developed um, many technical courses as well as seminars, but we also developed sensitivity campaigns and it was possible thanks to the involvement of local volunteers. And we provided prizes to local volunteers. So in this picture, you can see the top three recyclers. So La Paz, we develop um, a few events, totally five events called Your Recyclo, I Recycle, um, involving local young people, young leaders, we can say, in order to develop the recycling action and in order to spread the knowledge related to selective collection and recycling of municipal solid waste. And these activities allow increasing the involvement of local population for increase the selective collection and the formal recycling of municipal solid waste. In addition to that, we developed also um, questionnaire surveys as well as surveys with the population in order to collect information about um, the recycling and the recyclers perspective of solid waste management. So the main idea was to find who is doing selective collection in, in La Paz, who is supporting this action. By our research, we found that uh, the recycler profile is mainly uh, a woman with high school level that can be considered an undergraduate or graduate and with an age between 30 and 40 years old. So by this research it was, uh, interesting to find it to whom we had to focus our actions in order to better involve uh, new leaders, local leaders, to spread the knowledge of solid waste management, selective collection, and recycling. Meanwhile, there is, as I mentioned before, uh, there were a selective collection system that was both formal and informal. The informal system was mainly conducted by waste seekers that are uh, already present in the in the um, in the city, and you have to consider that about fifty percent of the waste that was selected collected was collected for sure from the waste pickers, as we could understand by the questionnaire survey. And we can add that there is a specific part of the population that do only formal selected collection system, really important for planning. In this regard, we can see that a medium or medium high income level family with a maximum of three people and that live in the central part of the area do selective collection with the formal system. But the other part of the population already do waste segregation and collect it and deliver it to the waste pickers, which is really important also to provide such an information to the local municipality in order to be aware about the potentialities of the involvement of such waste pickers. In addition, we developed also um, new technologies, new treatment systems. Here in this picture, you can see the first uh, construction demolition waste treatment plant uh, developed and built in Bolivia. Our project uh, allows the su uh, supporting the implementation of such recycling facility, which is uh, mainly a trituration system, a shredding system, and a shredding and sieving system for uh, segregating construction waste, demolition waste, in terms of uh, recyclable aggregates. And we develop also a material flow analysis for analyze the potentialities in terms of economic revenues and costs related to the system in order to incentivize the selective collection and recycling of construction demolition waste that to date are disposed of in water bodies or open dumping areas. The idea is to build uh, bricks made of recyclable materials. So this is the second part of the same treatment facility where the aggregates are mixed with cements and water for producing 
uh, ecological bricks, we can say. So to spread the knowledge related to how recyclable materials and secondary raw materials can be used for producing alternative um, goods that can be used for building parks or squares or in general public areas. In this picture, you can see another um, part of the treatment plants uh, developed during the project, such as a shredding system of uh, glass, waste glass. As you can see, we are speaking always on small scale treatment plants. So on, in this case, we would like to demonstrate that the preparation of waste to recycling is very important and can increase the value, the added value of waste. In this regard, uh, the shredded waste uh, increase the value, the market value of the secondary raw materials sold uh, into the market. So the main idea is that with another pretreatment, the local municipality can earn more, can have more revenues by selling uh, secondary raw materials. However, not all the waste can be recyclable, can be recycled. Therefore, the main idea of the project La Paz Recicla was also to provide knowledge related to the valorization of the non-recyclable waste. In this regard, uh, non-recyclable plastics and non-recyclable cardboard. The idea is that all the waste that is rejected by the material recycling facility it can be valorized with energy recovery. So we developed a, a machinery for, um, for briquetting, so for the densification of the material. And in this specific case, we mixed paper and cardboard waste with sawdust. And we developed analyses in order to identify the potentialities uh, of these briquettes, the local market, as well as the emissions. So to compare the beneficiary, the, the benefits of briquettes compared to coal, compared to fossil fuels or other conventional fuels. Similarly, we, we developed some research in order to identify the potentialities of secondary uh, recovered fuels in order to uh, avoid the use of carbon and in particular coal and uh, fossil fuels like methane in cement kilns. So the idea is that the non-recyclable waste that, can, um, that actually is disposed of in final disposal sites can be valorized for energy production in cement kilns for cement production. You can find more details about all these research in our scientific articles that I reported in these slides. Finally, we developed also a sensitivity analysis and an environmental analysis, generally speaking, um, about the potentialities of the whole project. So we analyze the life cycle assessments of the um, system boundary of our project, and we identified the um, carbon footprint as well as the environmental footprint of the system in order to evaluate how much the environmental impacts can be reduced thanks to a project like the Real Passer Recycler project. So sustainability of the action was related both to uh, environmental issues, social issues, and um, economic issues. So we identified and we tried to provide quantitative data related to the three pillars of sustainability. This approach, um, I started to develop it also in uh, uh, another context, uh, which is uh, the Nozibe Island in Madagascar. And this is the second case study that I would like to introduce you briefly in this webinar. So um, the experience in Bolivia uh, can be, of course, replicated in terms of methodology, not only in terms of technology introduction, as well as um, seminars or, or know-how improvements. The idea is to replicate the same methods in order to develop more projects anywhere. Nozi Bay is considered one of the most important touristic islands of Madagascar, and Madagascar is considered a low-income country, so a lower level compared to Bolivia. 
It is a quite small island which counts about 70,000 inhabitants, but it counts also before the COVID pandemic, it counts about 50,000 tourist arrivals per year, which is quite a lot compared to the local population. Uh, an Italian community lives there, and the main problem is the big difference between high income and low income. So there are there is a big issue related to wash conditions, and generally, generally speaking, technologies related to uh, wastewater treatment and solid waste uh, valorization or simply disposal. This is what we can see in the context uh, if we walk through uh, a normal city. Mm? Okay. So urbanization started to be developed very much near the hotels. And what we can see is that the hotels, uh, thanks to, to the tourists uh, that come from uh, abroad and at the international level, um, the income level is very, very high, thanks to their uh, touristic activity. However, uh, outside the hotels, we can see open dumping areas. So, the problem is very big, also related to the inflow of waste, of new goods that the high-income people can consume and the impossibility of local municipality to manage all these waste streams. So my action there was to evaluate the local situation, find the partners, and try to develop a draft, a project proposal, in order to find a solution or in order to demonstrate which can be a potential solution to be developed locally. The main problem is that roughly 95% of the waste locally is open bird or open dumped. And we can say that the waste characterization is related is about 75% of organic waste, 11% of wood, 9% of plastics, and we can say that 90% of the waste can be valorized. However, there is also some waste that is liquid waste, such as used cooking oil, that is not counted within this amount, uh, which are disposed in water bodies, so into the sea, hmm? simply speaking. And it is estimated that about 2.5 cubic meters of uh, used cooking oil per week are generated and disposed of in water bodies or worst used by the local population. So it's quite tricky also that uh, the problem related to um, food knowledge and food um, consumption. Of course, glass metals are sent to the mainland. They can be reused by the local population with return bottles or simply uh, metals are valorized. However, if we, if we consider this 90% of the waste, it has a potential um, to be valorized and to be not, not to be open dumped or open bird. So the main idea is to develop local opportunities in order to reduce also other environmental impacts, such as deforestation, which is a great impact there, and the lack of energy sources, because wood and coal are the main um, energy sources, the main fuels employed locally, which are unsustainable for local population as well as for the environment. So my work was to find who are the generators, who, which type of waste is generated, and which are the main flows, and which potential solution can be developed taking into account local technologies, local operators, and local know-how. So after identifying waste generators, the fractions, the collection system, the valorization, the idea is to find the potential products that can be generated and finally find the potential users in order to generate a circular economy of the waste. And this is the, uh, the scheme of such circular system. This is only an example related to, to wood waste and tree pruning, which are uh, a waste fraction that is generated for about 11%, as, as you saw in the previous slide. And this waste is disposed of into the sea or is left on the roads. And most of the time is open bird. 
So the idea is to show that this waste fraction can be valorized with the help of the local touristic activities, with the help of local generators. And the generators are sole mills, carpenters, that most of the time are Italian or French. So the idea is to involve hotels, sole mills, carpenters, in order to generate a circular economy of these waste involving local associations that are currently working in Nozi Bay and providing technologies that can be considered uh, of a, a low tech machinery, which are simple shredding system and densification systems, so briquetting machines, in order to mix um, paper waste with tree pruning, with wood, so sawdust uh, and wood chips in order to generate briquettes that can be valorized by local operators. And in particular, Nursey Bay is one of the most important producers of Ilang oil. And the idea is that the briquettes can be valorized by the same Ilang oil producers. So in conclusion, my presentation was dedicated to show you how the development project can be developed through a multidisciplinary and and we, with the support of the academy in order to spread the circular action in low and low middle income countries. So the international and multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teamwork can support the development of this project and the universities can provide the first step in order to develop such, such a project. And uh, the example of Madagascar can show you also how it's important to set priorities to take action towards the reduction of environmental pollution and boost the circular economy. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I hope that this presentation can be useful for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Navarro. And for the nice talk, now I ask if there is any uh, question for Navarro. Uh, for people who are here in the room, I can't ask you to come here to the microphone so that you can be heard by Navarro. Uh, otherwise, uh, people online can just uh, make questions. Guido, can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead, Mark. Unless there was someone else in the room uh, looking to ask a question, I can ask later. No, not no, not at the moment. So you can go. Thanks. Hello, Navarro. Very nice to Hello, Mark. Very, very interesting. Have you come across the name of a person named Sanokaji from Nepal? No, not okay. yet. So you should. Uh, Go online, I'll send something to you. About 20 years ago, Sanu Kaji began doing fuel briquetting in the Kathmandu. And he brought it to such a level of research. Um, and he, he teaches people, I was one of his students, that you can actually create fuel briquettes for specific uses. So, for instance, if you want to make coffee, you want to make a very porous fuel briquette with very high, I'm going to use the word octane, but it's really not octane, obviously, um, a sources that you would boil the water very quickly. But if you want to make a stew, for instance, you want to have a slow cooking heat and you can actually create fuel briquettes that will have different purposes. And he's been doing it for the past 20 years. You may want to talk in and, and, and see if you guys can help one another. Because he's that's what he lives on. He lives on by, he makes his living making fuel briquettes and teaching typically women to make fuel briquettes. Very, very interesting and simple technology. Thank you. Your, the talk was great. Thank you very much, Mark. I agree. I agree with you, and I hope to know this person in yeah. person, maybe. 
and, and to spread knowledge about this topic. Thank you. Well, actually, have you ever heard of the, the BBC challenge? There's something called the BBC um, Sustainable Challenge. He actually won it one year. Yeah, it was a big, yeah, it was a big deal. One of the also aims of these webinars is to create the networks and contacts among people and groups. So this is an interesting example. Any question or comments? I have one myself, Navarro. Uh, which do you think are the main challenges for scaling up from the pilot scale to a larger scale in the case of La Paz, for example, or in general, in this type of project? What, what is your, uh, I understand this was not part of the project, but considering the knowledge you have of the reality there, what do you think would be the two main challenges for scaling up? The first answer that I can say is that there are many. Uh, one is related, solid waste management is not related only on the treatment plant or not only on technology, but is also related on the, 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 the collection of the waste. So the, to provide the significant amount of waste that is currently and correctly separated and another topic is related to the tipping fee so the amount of money necessary to the first investment in order to to buy more more treatment plants and in order to develop the whole treatment system in developing countries the main problem is that the tipping fee paid by the local population uh, does not overcome the 20 or 30 percent of the money required to develop the complete solid waste management system. That is both for planning, for investments, and for managing. So this is a big issue in developing cities, and that can be also a great barrier to, to scale up such technologies or small scale treatment plants. Thank you. <laughs> There is a message in the chat from Stephen, Stephen from Florence. Sorry. Bless. Bless you. Poland's going around here. Uh, so Stephen uh, is asking if you could share a little bit about composting and how far he went with composting. Uh, as he realized that the highest percentage of waste in this area in Madagascar is organic waste. Of course, composting is quite simple to be developed and it is easy to, 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 to start composting activity. The main problem is that selective collection there is not implemented and this is the first barrier. So you cannot do composting system with mixed waste. If not, you are doing a bi-stabilization to be sent to, to sanitary landfill, first of all. And second, uh, the main problem is that with compost, you are not generating a market. I mean, of course, there is a market of compost, but the, the sale of compost and the treatment facility that you need to develop also the system, and maybe uh, it's the costs are very, very high sometimes, and especially in Nozi Bay, and the final product sometimes doesn't have a market. So maybe you can generate a small income, but it, the revenue does not cover the whole system. And if you would like to implement it in the whole island, you need a tipping fee. So the people should pay you for collecting the waste, treating the waste. So the problem is not only on the treatment, so it's not only composting, is to find someone that would like to invest in composting. I show you the example of briquetting only because local uh, ilang ilang oil producers require huge amount of energy and they are looking for some products that can be used instead of wood. So it's not about the treatment system, it's about the market. 
that we can generate in this context. Thank you very much. If there are uh, a metro. Hello, do you hear me? Ah, please. Navarro, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I have two or three questions. Let's see if I remember all of them. Okay, now first one is very simple, like uh, which kind of goods, uh, which kind of uh, raw material uh, the waste papers in the case of uh, uh, La Paz were most interested in too. Uh, then I was curious about uh, the strategy of, uh, let's say, that campaign that, uh, if I were understood, there was like kind of uh, prices uh, for the best recyclers. I want to ask a little bit the framework of this. How was the criteria? And third question, uh, I don't know if I, if I overcharge, I will repeat them. Uh, third question was about, um, okay, so you create like, you have an idea on the people, uh, the kind of people that were more likely to recycle. And in terms of strategy of, let's say, uh, awareness raising, should these be the targets or should the other people be the target eventually like younger people? Uh, these are my three questions. The last one, I guess, is quite open. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't hear the last question. Yeah. OK. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? I yes, didn't I hear, hear the you. second question, the third question. Yeah, the third question was like, uh, let's say, in terms of uh, raising awareness towards recyclables and so on. So yeah, if I well understood, uh, you identified, for instance, that women on a certain uh, uh, age were more likely to do recycling. So I was wondering, should this be, let's say, the target of an awareness campaign, or should be more younger people, uh, like let's say through schools, or maybe both, or uh, eventually people not doing this, that should be uh, aware about this. It's kind of, I don't know if it's clear. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, we speakers are interested in metals, plastics, and uh, white paper in La Paz, of course. And you have to think about that it is, it's a, a big city, so one million people. It, it is not a rural area. So there is a local market already in place. So if I would like to collect paper, already re exists a paper mill that would like to recycle this paper. The same for plastics in particular bottle and PED, HDPE, and, and metals, of course, metals all, all over the world. So um, cans and, and uh, every type of non-ferrous and ferrous metal. Uh, regarding uh, the second question was related to the strategy. Uh, okay, uh, can, you, uh, can you repeat the, the topic? I don't know. I'm not remembering either. Okay, okay, okay. I, I started from the last, so, yeah. <laughs> so that I remember. So the part, ah, no, no, now I remember. So the sensitivity campaigns, how recyclers, okay, okay. Yeah. No, okay. Regarding recyclers, uh, the, the thing that we did was that such recyclers should share knowledge among uh, local uh, companions, so colleagues or other people. So volunteers had an age between uh, 18 and 25 years old. Uh, and we asked them to share in TikTok or other Facebook, uh, Twitter, and other social media, uh, some some um, memes or some images related to recycling selective collection. Who was going to obtain more like, more attention on this topic and more comments would had a prize. So this was the first topic. And of course, during the campaigns, we did different actions. For example, who provided the most more interesting action for recycling some type of waste or uh, the, the uh, best recycling activity already in action in La Paz. So we did five different campaigns and to whom was the, the best for us. So all together with COPY, with the university, we decided 
to give the, the price to the best solution that can be considered replicable or can be considered also innovative for the local context. For the last topic, related to uh, women, we can say, so we found in a questionnaire survey, we interviewed 1,000 people of La Paz. And uh, by the statistical analysis, we identified these, uh, these outcomes. And uh, you have to see these results in terms of who can be the potential leader of future actions to be developed in La Paz. So it's not about the target of an action. So I can do a seminar, a webinar, or a sensitivity campaign for the general population. There is not a target. Uh, of course, it, for children, for older people, uh, or for the general population, of course, might change. But this, the, um, our focus was related to who can be the leader, who can take the lead to develop new solutions in La Paz to involve more people more citizens. And indeed, our results were effectively what we found. So all the leaders of our project were women. So I worked only with women. It was quite quite nice to so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, I think we'll uh, now move to the next speaker. So thanks so much, Navarro, for being Thank with you. us. It's Very a pleasure to, to meet again and uh, to see what you are doing. And uh, now I'll very briefly introduce uh, our second speaker, Professor Mark Talesnik from Technion in Israel. Um, so, Mark, you will say uh, uh, more precise words about yourself than uh, I could do, but uh, I just want to recall that uh, we met uh, probably six years ago or so in a uh, conference of UNESCO chairs uh, in uh, uh, in Lausanne, I think, and uh, we um, we were some UNESCO chairs uh, uh, representatives uh, from engineering schools, and uh, we had uh, several discussions about the role of engineers in development, uh, uh, or around also the concept of. Uh, global engineers, global engineering, or uh, what is needed for uh, engineering to address uh, uh, challenges that have global dimensions, but then are perceived at local level. And uh, so thanks again very much for joining us today. Uh, I will leave you the floor for, uh, for the talk. And uh, forgive me if I probably Forget some important things for presenting you, but I'll ask you to present directly yourself. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Mark. Okay, great. No, no, no problem, Guido. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you guys see my screen and can you hear my voice? Yes, both. Okay, great. Um, so actually, I really enjoyed the, the, the first talk and, and I can definitely see the connection between what I'm going to talk about, what you heard before, and really some of the objectives of uh, the UNESCO chair um, of your program. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also going to aim a little bit differently. So I don't know how many people are in the room or are looking uh, together on uh, at these two talks, but really, my aim are the students. And we, we often get so involved in the, a community that we're working with or a technology that we're trying to advance in the community that we overlook the importance of how our students are going to educate themselves. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. So I'm going to start off with a question. Now, typically when I do this talk, I, I'm in a room with people and not 2,000 kilometers away, and we can actually have a bit of an argument, but I'm not going to try to do that now. If you go into the, into the Webster Dictionary and look up engineering, first of all, it'll be called a noun. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But this is the type of 
definition that we have in Webster about engineering. It's about building bridges, building roads, or using scientific method. I hate that definition. I would much rather think of engineering as a verb, it's something you do. And the more modern definition of engineering includes economics, social attributes of what you're doing, it's design, build, and maintain, and it's looking for an appropriate solution. So we're looking at something which is far more holistic. The problem is, if this is a better definition of engineering, how come we don't teach this? Now, if anyone has any comments during this talk, please just unmute yourselves and scream it out because I can't see you and you guys need to help me. So if I'm talking about how do I want to affect what an engineering student should be learning, and I'm going to try to use words like learning and education rather than teaching. So if you look back very, very loosely at what learning was, it was sort of a linear, a linear approach where the lowest form of learning is knowledge and then comprehension and application. And to analyze something, synthesize much something, and at the very end to evaluate, but when you really look at this a little bit more closely, engineering is all of this. And, and at least the last four, synthesis, evaluation, analysis, and application happen together. That's what engineering is. Um, and, and the question is, are we trying to create this type of situation in, in engineering schools. Now, engineering schools all over the world work differently. A, I live in a country where technology is almost worshipped. Um, unfortunately, engineering understanding of a situation is not. So for instance, I am a civil engineer. And I work in a department of civil engineering. But really, only about three or four percent of the university professors in my department can actually design something. Everything else is just math, which is very, very unfortunate. What should engineering studies look like? What should be involved in an engineering education? So on one side, on the right, on the left-hand side, we'll look at the garden variety. That's what I'm sort of used to seeing around the world. It's usually very, very in-depth and very, very focused. So if you're going to be an environmental engineer, you're going to learn about a, a wastewater systems. You're going to learn about um, water systems, and you're going to possibly learn a bit about water quality. And everything is going to be forced down that one specific path. And because it's forced down that one specific path, you are differentiating yourself or the university is differentiating you from any other type of engineering. So this is, this is called the silo effect. And the silo effect is a very bad thing because God forbid any of my civil engineering should spill over into somebody studying biology or sociology. Often, this type of education is based on teaching. We're teaching. In the global variety, and in a moment, we're going to talk about a global engineer and what we want a global engineer to have. Our aim should be something that can be more holistic, something that's more general, something that would allow a journalism student to sit in class with a civil engineer and both of them gain something from what we're, what's going on in the classroom that they could take home and then use to make something better in the world we live in just by 
the fact that they uh, uh, studied together. The idea is to spread and to integrate. And in the end, rather than teaching, we're educating. Now, let's try to define what we want a global engineer to be able to do. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here. Now, the first thing is that I expect that an engineering student, in order to be a good engineer, will have a social conscience and he will be responsible. What will he be responsible for? Well, obviously he'll be responsible for his clients, but he'll also be responsible for the environment. He will be responsible for creating, well, at least thinking about sustainable solutions rather than just doing what has always been done. Now, in order to do this, you have to work in diverse groups. You have to have cross-cultural and cross-professional access. Without that, there's just no way these two things can happen. Um, what does that mean? It means that engineering students have to learn together with biologists, with journalists, with sociologists, um, with doctors. When you think about it, engineers and doctors have a huge amount of, of things in common. Um, of those things that we talked about in terms of responsibility is the whole concept of sustainability um, and sustainable development. And when you look back to when people began writing down what sustainable development is, the, the idea of meeting the future needs of the world became very important. One of the issues is that we have no idea what the future of our world will need. So in 1987, when, when this was written down, I'm not sure anyone knew what we would need 50 years later or 40 years later. There's some very interesting work being done about what sustainability is. And I know that I'm gonna to try to make this the last definition that I'm gonna show you today, but it's a dynamic process. And it's all about being able to reach full potential without putting too much load on the carrying capacity of the environment which we live in. So obviously it's got to do with population growth because the more populous we have, it's gonna be put more pressure on the environment we live in. And hopefully full potential will not be completely um, overridden by, by the population uh, uh, that we're trying to put on our earth. So when you think about it, and in a moment, I'm gonna show you a slide that you all know, but this is an interesting slide as well. So this is the 10 commandments. And if you look at the 10 commandments carefully, you'll see that, or they're often divided into two. The left-hand set of commandments are between man and God. The right-hand side of the commandments are between man and man. Now, I'm not a religious person, but I see a lot in common between the Ten Commandments and the 17 development goals. If you look carefully at those sets of goals, we can also divide them into two. All of these ones, no poverty, zero hunger, reduced inequality, education for all, gender equality, these are things between man and man, a contract between man and man. And the other five that are listed here are between man and planet. So we are the custodians of the earth today, and we have to make sure that there will remain clean water on our planet and that life below the sea won't die because of what we're doing on the land. So this is part of the social conscience and responsibility that I think are not being taught correctly. And here I 
caught myself, I use the word taught, educated correctly in universities today. I sincerely hope that in Italy, some of the universities are doing this better than we are in Israel. A second thing that I think a global engineer needs to have is hands-on abilities. Now, it's not just about using your hands. It's also about working on things that are real, okay? Hands-on work is not just, okay, can I close the electrical circle circuit, but it's also about working on real-world problems with real-world constraints. Now, typically in the university environment, at the end of a lecture, a university professor might say, you know what? I would like you to solve questions eight through 12 in chapter six for next class. But when you open up the questions that are in chapter six, they're gonna be very well constrained and they probably only have one solution and you probably have to be trained technically in order to, to solve them. But the real world isn't like that. The real world, the problems are very poorly constrained. And in the real world, there is not just one solution. And in the real world, it's very, very possible that a person living in a remote village in Ethiopia may be able to solve that better than an engineering student that is studying in Boston. Third, and this might sound corny to some of you, I expect students of engineering to be leaders. I expect them to be able to take their skills and use them to make the world a better place and the people around them to have more abilities. Um, now, maybe it's not fair of me to say this, but I'm a little bit tired of looking at the people who run our societies. Now, I, I would love to ask the question where do these people come from? The people that lead society today often come, the, uh, you know what, I'll use a dirty word, the politicians of today aren't typically engineers and they're not typically biologists and they're not typically environmental science scientists. But I think that doctors, biologists, journalists, army generals, all need to learn the same thing. And only that way can we create a condition where we can instill positive change. I believe the correct way for a global engineer to have influence on society is by helping cause positive change. And I'm sure that universities and academic institutions should be doing that as well. They should not just be focusing on transferring knowledge. The question is, how do you go about this, making this change? Universities, and I'm sure that Guido can tell you, are like ocean liners. There are huge boats on the ocean that in order to change their direction requires a huge amount of inertia. And implementing change is not a simple thing. And very few people like having their cheese moved while they're working, okay? They wanna wake up in the, in the morning and do the same thing that they always have. And I like to quote a friend here, a very dear friend of mine that used to say, the only thing that truly likes change is a wet baby. So when I first tried to come to my university and try to pitch this idea of what should we be doing and what is this global engineer that I'm trying to create, they laughed at me. 
they literally laughed at me. They they thought I was crazy. Um, and then the same man, Bernard, said to me, Mark, listen, you're, you're speaking a language they don't understand. And then I set up another meeting and I showed them this equation. And they loved it. He said, wow, why didn't you say this before? Okay, now you've laid this out correctly. You have a global engineer. That's what you want to create. Bring me a conventional engineer. That's what we do anyhow. Give him a shot with some sort of engineering supplement. And it works. But please don't use the word change. Now, it was very hard for me not to laugh at them because Delta is changed. The question is, what is that engineering supplement? What is it that needs to be brought into the educational process that gives this, gives those three things that I was talking about, social conscience, responsibility, hands-on capabilities, real world capabilities, and leadership qualities. So we came up with three broad seg segments that we needed to do. One was real, real world engineering. And we started it at the Technion about 18 years ago, something called Engineers Without Borders, which allows us to have students work together with communities. Nothing, if you notice, I did not say work for communities. And I did not say work at a community. I said work with a community. We developed a course called Engineering for Developing Communities that would help our students understand how to work together with a community. And we tried, failed, I will say, to create an institutional wing at our university based on a UNESCO chair that would induce research into engineering for developing communities. Um, th this was our proposal, education, institutionalization, and real world engineering. And we called it the Center for Global Engineering. Um, and what I would like to sh show to you now is what we tried to do. I'm gonna focus on the, on the left-hand side of this slide. Everything that I'm going to I'm going to show you now, or allow you to ask questions about later, was done voluntarily by the staff that worked on the projects, and by the students that got involved in it. Students did not get credit for anything they did here, and academic staff was not paid to do it. There was an also an academic path where we actually taught, but these were four credit courses, which help students get involved in, in the volunteer path. So I'm gonna, each one of these pictures, each one of these pictures is a topic. It's a topic from which behind sits a community, a community that the students worked together with. Um, so when I spoke to Guido about giving this talk, um, he asked for the biogas one. But in, in theory, we can talk about any one of those. And if we have time, a, in, in, a few in a few moments, we can come back and, and look at a different one. So let's, let's look at biogas in Nepal. So I don't know how, how much you guys know about Nepal. Nepal, Nepal is stuck between India and China. Um, they're landlocked. In Nepal a, is a country which has seen huge disasters in, in over the past 10 years. This was a project that we began as a partnership about a, 13 years ago in the very, very eastern tip of Nepal in a province called Ilam. Ilam is a very, very poor a, community. 95% of the population are subsistence farmers. They typically uh, families of five to six people. Almost every family will have a little bit less of, than a dunam of land. 
most families will have three or four large animals. Um, most families do not have electricity. Um, a, and most families live on a very, very small a, amount of money per day. So this is the village of Nam Saling in Ilam. And we arrived in Nam Saling a, through friends of mine who had worked there a, for many years. And we were invited into the village to try a, to work together with people um, on topics that the people of the village decided upon. Um, meet Indira. Indira is a Nepali woman. Um, the kitchen that Indira is in now is actually a room outside of the house. Indira is cooking in the kitchen with wood. Um, all the families in Namsaling cooked on wood. Um, the moment or the very first day that I was there, I remember asking to come help Indira cook. And she said, well, let's see how long you last. And, and she was talking about smoke. Um, and it, it took me a while to get used to it. And we learned from Indira and from everyone else that typically each Nepali household, and this is true about the winter time of the year, will use close to 40 kilograms of wood a day. So that's a tremendous amount of wood. If you do the math, Let's even say if it was 20 kilograms a day on 365 days a year, how much wood is being carried and what that means in terms of deforestation, what that means in terms of moving the wood. Somebody had to collect that wood. Most families, I said before, have two or three large animals. Um, one of the issues that we saw right away in the village was the fact that cows um, aren't allowed to roam, which means that all of the feces, the urine and the manure basically pile up very close to the house. They cause issues of groundwater pollution. Most homes do not have a personal sanitation and open defecation was very prevalent. So the water, which is plentiful in Nepal, was tainted and you could not drink it, which means in order to drink it, you have to boil it, which means if you're boiling it, you need more wood. So the wood is not used just for cooking and for heating. It's also used for cleaning the water. It's actually also used even to produce food for the larger animals. So you need more wood and you're creating more smoke. And this is the type of situation that you see in an Nepali household uh, when you go for breakfast or for dinner uh, during the day. And our students spent a huge amount of time doing interviews with focus groups and with speaking mostly with the women of the village, to understand what were the things that were most bothersome to them. Among the things that we learned was that a Nepali woman has 30 times the chance of dying of respiratory, respiratory disease at a young age than a woman in the West. And they came away with, I, a, a large amount of issues um, through participatory community appraisal. Uh, and I'd like to read them to you because we're gonna, we're gonna look at these a little bit more closely in a second. Poor use of time, indoor smoke, poor water quality, deforestation, gender issues, poor sanitation and hygiene. And when you look at these different issues, you can understand that some of them have common roots. You can really connect between poor water quality, indoor smoke, and poor sanitation because it affects health. And you can look at quality of life, obviously gender issues and poor use of time, especially for women collecting wood, and it's always the woman collecting wood. 
and obviously issues of the environment. If you're using a lot of wood, you're de causing deforestation. And if you're creating a toxic water, then you're affecting the environment in the same way. And the most important issue that the students came away from when they did this type of problem tree analysis that I haven't shown you here, but this is what they did. They came away with the idea that the lack of clean energy was a common root to all of these problems. If there was a good form for clean energy, that could not solve things, but it could have positive impact on many of the issues that are, are listed here. And they came up with the idea of using biogas. Now, it was not, they did not invent biogas. Biogas has been out there for many, many years. Uh, each one of us has our own little private biogas digester. But typically, a biogas digester is a closed volume where you can keep air away from the material that is going to be digested. And if you feed a biogas digester about 50 kilos of fodder a day, and this is a, di this is a household digester, it's about six meters cubed, it will produce enough methane to give you cooking fuel basically for three meals a day. Um, 50 kilos a day of what? Well, I told you before that each most families had cows, pigs, and goats. That was the material required for manure. We also suggested putting human manure in. Um, that became a huge cultural issue and wasn't accepted. Um, the methane is used for cooking, and the output, what's left over from this system, is probably the best uh, compost that you can create. It's the best compost simply because all of the methane, which actually would burn crops, is used in the cooking process, and the output from the slurry is doesn't contain a, a methane in it. And we went about trying to create this type of system in Nepal very quickly. We understood that we had no idea what we were doing, but the people of the village knew exactly how to build this thing. And very, very quickly, they taught us how to use bamboo correctly, we found all the materials that we needed in order to start building together with them biogas digesters. Um, I'll just show you the process that we went through. Everything was found locally. Working together with people of the village, we created these templates that were able to be reused in many reactors. This is what the reactor would look like before we concreted the top. This is after the, con the top was concreted. And we would then, after three days, go into the reactor and take apart the template. There was in the inside, you can think of it like scaffolding. And then it was moved over to a secondary site. And eventually, when we went home, the template kept on moving around. And as far as we know, there were 99 of these reactors built in the village of Nam Sabin. We were aiming for a thousand. Um, we didn't get there. Um, we worked in Nansaling for a period of close to eight years. Um, this is a picture of Indira. The very, very first time she turned on the gas to her biogas say, reactor. Um, Indira's reactor worked for about a six years. Um, it became damaged. We had to fix it. It was fixed. And then it worked for another two years and it became damaged again. And this was part of the problems that we, we were dealing with as time went by. But what I'd like to address is, is what did we achieve? It wasn't just about 
the biogas reactor in, in Indira's house or the other 98 reactors that were built in Namsalim. It had to do about the students that were involved in this project. Did it change them as people? Did it change them as leaders? And what I can say to you is categorically, yes. These people, these students that got involved in this type of work have a completely different, different vision of engineering, what's important in engineering than most engineering students have. They have a different education. Their education is based also upon hands-on abilities, also upon getting involved in a project, project also upon a cross-cultural, cross-professional type of education. They learn to address the right issues. The solution is not the technology. The solution is understanding what the right approach to take is. We've been able to do this in other places around the world. We're working currently in Kenya. We worked extensively in Ethiopia prior to the civil war that broke out there four years ago. And we're working obviously in Israel. Um, and if I can answer any questions, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mark. It was uh, very interesting to, to hear the talk. Now I'm asking to the people in the room, we are almost 10 people in the room and uh, several people online, which I now can't see exactly, but uh, if there are any questions uh, for Mark. I will start just with a comment and a reflection, maybe a question. Uh, I don't know if the situation in Italian universities is better or uh, worse compared to your universities. First, because I don't know much the situation in your university. Second, because maybe I have the view of our university here and I have the view of some other universities uh, in Italy. Uh, when, when you, it, it was nice for me to, uh, to listen to what you think, uh, what you, from your experience, uh, let's say the, the mathematical, the delta E supplementary, <laughs> or uh, what uh, ideally engineers uh, for present and the future should learn uh, together with the technical knowledge. And uh, maybe we phrase them uh, somehow differently, but I think uh, most of the, uh, what you have, you, you mean behind these three items, uh, responsibility and social conscious, uh, hands-on engineering and leadership are, uh, quite shared among us. Uh, we have some differences, maybe uh, we stress some, uh, maybe some we put emphasis on some uh, different things sometimes, but uh, there is a clear common understanding. And uh, uh, so that, that just to comment on what you have said, also because you asked the, if the situation in Italian university is better or not. What I can say, or I was forgetting this, what I can say is that uh, there are uh, different uh, individual, let's say different research groups or university groups, meaning uh, groups of teachers, uh, researchers uh, in different universities in Italy that are pushing in this direction, not only in engineering, of course. And uh, maybe in engineering, we are three, four groups, uh, I don't know. I know of many more. Maybe, maybe I'm missing someone in the country, I would say. But uh, with continuity, I mean, steadily working in, the, in these directions. Well, that's good, because I think uh, 
at least the university that I come from almost looks at this uh, with a little bit of distaste in their mouth. Um, it's not real engineering. It's sort of engineering. Um, I, I would say that if I could, it would the supplement would be in every course. Okay, so if you have a, a semester and you have 12 or 13 lectures in a semester, why can't in every course, one lecture have something to do with sustainability, something to do with leadership, something to do with social conscience? It wouldn't be that difficult. Even you, you could create a lecture in differential equations that would have something to do with sustainability. I'm positive you could. This was our last discussion in uh, our course study meeting in environmental engineering. About It was about sustainability, not about uh, social consciousness, but uh, there was some discussion going on on this, uh, uh, checking how we can uh, improve uh, these concepts uh, uh, in, the, in the entire course, not only the dedicated seminar or something. Yeah. So I'll open the... I'll ask if it would be nice to hear some viewpoints of some student in engineering on on this. Uh, there is something in the chat. Thank The eyes of the people around here look uh, quite tired, though you should be more tired because uh, I don't know what's the time, but it's probably 10 or 9. No, 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 no. We're, we're an hour, an hour ahead of you. Oh, just an hour. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, no sweat. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, there is a question. Good. Is now Massimo is coming. Uh, Massimo is also teaching in our program. So you can you can see visually each other in place. Hello, Mark. Hello. Greetings, Greetings from our planet. You really live in another planet. Congratulations! Super, super interesting uh, presentation. Uh, given that uh, we are sharing the same sensitivity in uh, considering uh, students uh, as a development project, a human development project. <laughs> Each one, I mean. And thank you for uh, your very strong uh, effort in trying to transform in images, everything. My question is uh, focusing on the neutrality when we are adding a cell, uh, cell orientation, let's say in uh, the knowledge and the preparation and, uh, and the skills. Uh, the soft skills uh, are not enough because uh, we are speaking now about uh, um, value orientation. And when you are suggesting to, to work with people, close to people, with community, you are suggesting students a way in which you can orient your value vision. What about this? Because uh, many times I, I feel that uh, speaking about the orientation of uh, the players of development cooperation, for instance, in implementing the uh, development agenda uh, are oriented by specific values, but the university must be neutral or uh, balanced, let's say. And so it's a very difficult job for me as a teacher not to be uh, um, out of the line of border of the neutrality. So what about of this? Thank you. Wow. So I, I, I don't know how much you guys here in Israel, here in, in, here in Italy about what's happening today in Israel. Um, and, and I think that academics, and university institutions have to take a stand. We must take a stand. 
Um, if we don't take a stand, who's going to take the stand? Who's going to say that things need to be balanced? Um, true, it's not always easy, and there are going to be some very huge bumps in the road. Um, but I believe that eventually, universities, every good university will have programs like what you guys are running. Now you can see it happening. When you look at ABET, ABET is the American committee that accredit gives accreditation to universities. And they are saying very, very openly that in order for university to be ABET accredited, students have to have the broad challenges of, of a whole list of different possibilities. It cannot just be engineering. There has to be some form of general study that will broaden their perspective of how engineering, how their engineering will affect society. They say it very, very clearly. clearly. They actually say 12 credit points out of 140 or 135, depending on the program, credit points must be something that has social value. Now, I don't know if that is happening in Europe or in Italy, but it is starting to happen. And I believe that as time goes by, more and more universities are going to push for this because students are asking for it. Students want this. Now, I know that as for a fact, because when I started Engineers Without Borders here at the Technion, three years later, I had my daughter started studying at the university and she got involved with Engineers Without Borders and I could see the difference that happened to her. And I also saw how easy it was for her to get a job because of some of the experiences she had through Engineers Without Borders. When you go to a job interview and after you talk for 30 seconds about your grades, what are you gonna talk about? Oh, I'll talk about Engineers Without Borders. And it's very easy to talk about Engineers Without Borders. Very easy to talk about the project that you did in Ethiopia or the project that you're working on in Kenya or the project that you're working on in the desert in Israel. There's added value. This is win, 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 win. And that's what we need to focus on. We just have to keep pushing. I don't know if that answers the question. But I'm, what I'm saying is, I don't care what the university wants. I'm going to do what I think is right. Thanks, Mark. There is a question from the chat. Could you share a little bit about the long-term sustainability of projects? Yeah. For example, building the capacity of the community to sustain a completed project. Okay. This is in line with your comment about the problems related to the biodigester project after some year. It's yeah. Stephen from Florence. Yeah. Okay, very, very good question. And obviously, correct. So the long-term, the longevity of a project or a partnership is is very important and when we started out here we were hoping the idea was to be able to get to a point where a, a biogas cooperative would have been developed in the community and that the community would actually be making money by producing these biogas reactors not just within their own community but in communities close by. It started to work. Unfortunately, what happened was that over time, as we started to withdraw from the community, because we did not want to create a, a complete dependence, also the funding went down because what happened was, and I didn't say this, every biogas reactor that was, was built 
came from three, the, the funding came from three sources. A third came from the family. They had to produce about $120 in kind work. So it could be bringing the raw materials. It could be buying the raw materials. It could be bringing the workforce to build the reactor. A third of the money came directly from us. We brought in 30%, 33%. And we were able to work together with something called the Biogas Support Program, which is a program that is actually was started by the, in the Holland and Norway, where they were supporting biogas projects um, as long as there was other money coming in. They would not support an entire project. They would support a third of the project. That's the way we built it. And the idea was that we would be able to create this co-op that would eventually be able to replace the 30% that we were bringing in. And it started to work, but obviously the capacity that we thought that we were able to develop did not happen. And this is probably one of the biggest issues in development projects where you overestimate your ability to create capacity um, or you leave prematurely. Um, we actually don't think we left prematurely because we had a contract with the community for six years, ended up staying eight years. But we obviously overestimated the development of capacity in the community. Now, there also were some other issues, no doubt about it. Nepal is still a layered society. The caste system, while being outlawed in Nepal, is truly alive and well in Nepal. And that has huge cultural effects on how funds are distributed and how aid is given. You're right, your, your question is spot on. It's one of the biggest problems we have to deal with. Thank you. So I think we are coming to the end. Uh, probably we want a bit ahead of time. Sorry for that, to, for, to all the participants. I think uh, it has been, uh, I mean, one key message that to me is coming out of these couple of webinars, uh, of seminars, uh, uh, is that we have, uh, let's say, two levels. Uh, one is the level, uh, because we are from an engineering school, uh, and one is the level of uh, all the process that uh, for which uh, engineering student uh, first and then uh, graduate students uh, and then and maybe more uh, in a more advanced stage uh, come through a process in which uh, they somehow uh, add a viewpoint or some viewpoints uh, to their professional life to engineering and uh, and this is a strong enrichment and uh, in this, the, let's say the scale, uh, the overall impact of the project to which they are exposed uh, is important, but maybe it's not a crucial thing. On the other level, we have uh, 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 development projects uh, in which the presence of students is of course important, but maybe it's not a priority of the project, but achieving impact, scaling up and so on is a crucial thing. And uh, somehow we are, uh, as a school, as a university, we are in the somehow in the middle between these two levels, and we try to combine them, which is, uh, uh, I think, is a, is is a nice uh, uh, innovation we are trying uh, in different countries to to do ahead. Um, okay, unless there is any quick final issues, also on the series of webinars, I would like uh, to thank again. Uh, Mark, for staying with us until this time <laughs> and for bringing your experience. I hope we will have a chance to meet in person soon. So do I. Part of the world. Uh, and um, yeah, and uh, the next uh, um, the next webinar will be on now. I don't remember exactly.
on the 20, 29, but uh, of March, uh, you have all the links, I think, in the email, and we also showed the, the um, uh, yeah, the slides in the beginning. So thanks a lot. Have a nice dinner, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. La registrazione. Può interrompere? Sì.